The .NET Core podcast is supported by our listeners who have become patrons. To see a full list of the patrons, or to join them, head over to .netcore.show slash patrons. Hello everyone and welcome to the .NET Core podcast, an award-winning podcast where we reach into the core of the .NET technology stack and with the help of the .NET community, present you with the information that you need in order to grok the many moving parts of one of the biggest cross-platform multi-application frameworks on the planet. I am your host, Jamie Gaprogman taylor In this episode, I talked with Harrison Farron about the extremely low barrier to entry that Unity and other modern video game engines have how you don't need to have any programming experience in order to get started with them, and his book, Learning C Sharp by Developing Games with Unity 2021. Along the way, we discussed how programming classes should really have a reading list, which contains both theory books and fictional novels. One of Harrison's suggestions is to have William Gibson's Neuromancer as required reading for programming classes. I'll let him explain why in a moment. We also discussed the idea that almost anyone can be a programmer, as we're already doing it on a daily basis. As Harrison says, Take input, make a decision, perform an action. So let's sit back, open up a terminal, type in .NET New Podcast, and let the show begin. So Harrison, my friend, it's really good to have you on the show. My goodness. Um, Thank you ever so much for spending part of your morning, my evening, talking to the folks because... You know, it's it's always fun to talk to other developers, and uh, and and I feel like we're going to have a great time talking today. Oh, I do too. Uh, thanks for having me on, Jamie. This is going to be a good time. This is my first podcast, so I've oh. never, I've never, I think this is my first podcast. I don't think I've ever done this before. <laughs> Hopefully, we can uh, we can sort of guide you into it very easily. Yeah, we'll just have um, a chat very gently. Yeah, that's it, and that's all it is, right? It's just two developers having a chat about net based stuff and that's what i really like about this show mm-hmm. so yeah welcome to the show and thanks for being on the show my goodness thank you thank you <laughs> okay um so uh would you mind would you mind giving the the audience a bit of a, a maybe an elevator pitch about harrison who he is what he does um, sure. a little bit maybe about your background maybe that kind of thing just so that everybody knows who you are what you're doing all that kind of stuff yeah of course um so I started out as an English major. I am now uh, a software developer. So between then and they, then and here, uh, there's been some boot camps. Uh, I went back to school for game programming and design. Uh, I worked at a few startups, and then I kind of transitioned into iOS um, just to pay the bills and figured out that I really love Swift and making apps like that. So... Uh, you know, took that as far as I wanted to take it, uh, and then sort of started to sort of strike out on my own and start teaching, which I found I actually liked more. <laughs> so I've I've worked at Microsoft, I've worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, I have courses on Pluralsight and LinkedIn. Uh, this is my first foray into writing a book, or the first foray into a book series, I should say. And uh, most of the time, I kind of just write or make things and figure out how to, t- I, I, I build stuff to learn and then I teach it. That's kind of what makes, you know, what makes my brain go, Oh, this is a good time. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, I have to admit that, uh, when I graduated from university, uh, 2008, there were no computer programming jobs in my area because right? what, because of obviously the, you know, the credit crunch and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. And so I went and did a uh, teacher training. Right, so I okay. got the training to do um, uh, high school mathematics. I can actually hear right now. Can actually hear a friend of the show, Paul from Coach uh, Coach Out UK, actually complaining about the fact that I, I'm saying I used to be a teacher because he, <laughs> he sends me a text every couple of episodes that go out. He sends me a text that goes, "You talked about being a teacher again." <laughs> yes, I did. It's part of my identity. I'm a teacher. <laughs> no, that was the same. That was the same sort of thing for me when I got out of. Uh, my game design program. I was in Chicago and 
they had just gone through a huge downsizing in the industry. Um, and they were really only, I want to say like Midway Games had closed, which was the big hitter. And there was, there were a couple like high voltages in the suburbs and Nether Realm is downtown, the people who make Mortal Kombat. But, you know, the program only, you know, there's, there's not enough jobs for the people that graduate. So I kind of just went into iOS and I was like, oh, this is great. I'll, I'll do some of this and I'll do Unity on the side. And I ended up teaching Unity anyway. So it all works out. Mm hmm. Absolutely. And, um, what I really love about teaching is it, it sort of lights up part of my brain. When I can, when I can, it's less about here's some knowledge I'm going to give to you. And it's more about when you, I mean, I do obviously share the knowledge, but it's when, when you can look at the other person and it just clicks and they get that eyes wide up and that whole, oh, yeah. oh my goodness, I get this now. It totally makes sense. And that moment is just amazing to me. Those are the best <laughs> things. Like I, those are the messages that I save on LinkedIn or, you know, on, or on email or something. When I get somebody that reads a book or, uh, you know, does a course and they're like, wow, I thought I knew all this. And like, it just sank. I was like, that's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is the best. Um, I don't get that these days, but uh, hopefully soon I'm going to be um, going to be helping out some uh, students at a, a local college, oh, cool. um, offering some advice and stuff. So hopefully uh, I'll start getting that again. But who can say, right? This is me publicly saying it before I've actually announced it to the kids at the college that I'm going to be helping them out. So you heard soon. it here first, folks. Coming Absolutely soon. coming soon. <laughs> um, so the, the, there was something that I found on your uh, so. Obviously, you've said you know earlier you've read some books, you've done some plural site courses. There's something I found on your plural site bio that I just want to call out, and I just want to ask if you can explain <laughs> I think that I on, know what it is. Bit. And it, uh, <laughs> it's a line that says um, Harrison is continually uh, has continually wondered why Neuromancer isn't on more game development course syllabuses. <laughs> syllabi. I'm not sure of the. Yeah, it's. I, I think wondered. it's syllabi like octopi or octopus. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. but. Yeah, so I put that in there every. I always every time I write something for copy, I always put something in that's like a. I know that it's for a certain like people like me, like like minded, like like interested people, and I you know it's kind of like a radar. It's like a you know it's something in the code that kind of just gets gets tripped over, and you know you're with somebody that is with it. But uh, yeah, I love William Gibson and Neuromancers, my favorite sci-fi book. But I. I had this conversation when I first went to uh, one of my intermediate game level classes and the teacher was really awesome and he's always giving us things to read that weren't programming related. He's like, you need to go, go read this, go read that. Like, it's awesome, whatever. It might be old, it might be new. And I was, I talked to him, I was like, this is a really good idea because this is the stuff that most likely the, the people who are responsible for the technology we have now were inspired by. So why wouldn't you go look at this? Like, it's like looking at source code, like go look at what inspired people like, you know, Steve Jobs or Steve Wozniak or whoever, like it could be anybody, but the people that are responsible for our technological point <laughs> in our history, most likely read that book and books like it. And they were, you know, their minds were blown and they were like, God, where, how could I make this happen? Like, where, where would I fit in and what could I do to like make this a reality? Because like at that Absolutely. point, there was no such thing as like a council cowboy. Like virtual reality wasn't a thing. That was all made up. And it turns out like it's pretty close. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's pretty close to like wearing an Oculus. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have to say, I, uh, I have read Neuromancer and some of the uh, William Gibson uh, books. They're not necessarily for me, but I love the cyberpunk genre of storytelling. Right. This whole idea of like a a tech noir um cyberpunky uh stick it to the man sort of idea i love that right it uh, somehow yeah. goes together like the detective noir and high tech but low brow in the gutter kind of blade runner sort of thing and it looks good together for some mm -hmm. reason it all kind of just was made to fit absolutely some, you know and i was like oh great this is wonderful <laughs> Absolutely. And I feel like it's like a, a, only like a natural progression for things like, uh, like you say, film noir detective stories, right? Uh, 10 years in the future, we'll be, we'll be all watching um, CSI 
I don't know, CSI, uh, I'll immersive. say CSI. Yeah, <laughs> CSI <you're>, immersed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where it comes to your living room. God, Absolutely. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be yeah. crazy? <laughs> yeah, why not, right? Um, but I love that idea of looking at the source code for the ideas, right? Because uh, if you look at um, uh, Star Trek as an example, right? Mm -hmm. You look at some of the things that they came up with for the next generation, just tablets they could tap and read stuff sure. with. And guess what? It's I've all got there. Quite literally in front of me, right? <laughs> yeah. The only thing we don't have is the the like body scanner. And that's already, I would even say that like there are AR devices now that are doing part of that. They don't mm -hmm. do the diagnostics, but they do the imaging from a device that you can like, you know, scan somebody with. So they're pretty close. Mm -hmm. Like I would, you know, the tablets I think are easier <laughs> than, than trying to image a body, mm -hmm. but you know, we're, we're, we're rolling in the right direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I wonder what, uh, what's being released as part of science fiction now that people will be using in about 30, 40 years. Who can say, right? Maybe it really know. will be the iPhone, right? Something that's in, like on right? Futurama, it's, right? Yeah, it's the i or like, yeah, there was an episode of Black Mirror that had everybody records everything that they see, and it's mm -hmm. sort of open unless you, you know, kind of put it in a, in a private cloud. I was like, that's probably there, or like Altered Carbon, which, you know, Netflix is about 20 years too late, but... I mean, it's like that was the, I think the, the data storage will be the next thing where we can pack more and more into a smaller and smaller, you know, piece of storage. And then that'll, yeah. that'll, that's the natural progression. We can't go bigger anymore. We're going to go way smaller. <laughs> totally. Totally. I mean, I was looking at, what was it? I was looking at a, a four terabyte SD card the other day. What? I'm like, that's just, <laughs> just. <laughs> what have you got that needs to be stored in that form factor at four terabytes, right? <laughs> right, like, isn't all the music in the world, like, two terabytes? I thought you could have so much, like, as much, you could listen to a year of me. I read something silly somewhere where it was like, you could listen to, you know, a year on, and never see it, listen to the same song, and it would only fill, like, a terabyte or two. I'm yeah, sure that's yeah. the wrong quote. Someone can <laughs> write in and tell me the real one, but... Totally. Like, wow, that's a lot of that's a lot of data. Yep. Like, <laughs> what could you possibly have? I need a four terabyte. You walk into Best Buy. I need a four terabyte SSD drive, that's please. It, yeah. What? Why? Why? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I want to know what you're doing because it sounds cool. If you need that much. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my goodness. But yeah, I like that idea of looking at like, like reading reading books and stories around the thing that you're studying in yeah. to figure out like the the almost like the human uh, side of it right because we could spend forever reading you know um c sharp in depth by john skeet or co sure. complete and all you're learning is like it, it's 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 important knowledge and i'm going all in body quads right but all you're learning is like the way to build better software for or the developers and the compiler. Whereas really, we're building software for people to use, not for computers to, to read through, not for other people, right? Yeah, you have to have, yeah, I think that's an important, that's actually, that's a good point. That's, I think that's why I put that little line in my bio, because it, the, the course syllabus, while you might not have, you know, a course on it, you know, people should start teaching this sort of thing and programming, not just in games, but in like, you know, computer science, like you should have a reading list that's like mm -hmm. technical and non-technical and teachers should, or professors or whoever should kind of think back to what they want, like to what they learned and take a historical kind of approach and be like, this stuff is, you know, mind blowing. And it had a real effect that we enjoy today. If you don't think so, you're, you're crazy. Cause you know, those kind of, those kinds of books like are responsible for that spark. Like you said, that mm -hmm. makes you put all that knowledge, that technical knowledge that you absorb from textbooks into something real, into a real product. And without that, you just know syntax. Which is something I get asked all the time, like, why, like, it's just syntax. You can look it up. Mm -hmm. It's the concepts. No one, you know, no one cares if you can memorize how to do this stuff. The hard mm -hmm. part is, can you build a system or an application that has an architecture that's flexible and scalable and doesn't take hours and hours to make a tiny change. And if everyone is like, wow, that's, you know, it works. It's a beautiful system. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's the hard part. <laughs> yeah. 
It's like, uh, you know, authors will use spell check and grammar check. It might be like one of the many steps that they take to ensure that everything's correct, but they will do spell check and grammar check inside of their word processor because that's a tool that is available to them. So they don't have to necessarily remember all of the rules around spelling and grammar just because there are tools and other people in the way to help you sort of grok that correctly and make Mm -hmm. sure that everything is right. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, Which is why, you know, people who... You know, friends who have, uh, say, dyslexia or or uh, problems like that, they can also author books because uh, you know it doesn't. <laughs> it, to to, I don't want to reduce it, but to a certain extent, it, here come the bunny goes again. It doesn't matter because you can still you can still write your ideas down and have the computer or have another person help you with the spelling and the grammar and all that yeah, kind of stuff. It's not a limiter on your intent. There's not, it's, there, the, those kinds of things are to help people, not to not to exclude. I mean, mm-hmm. I I have terrible. I I had to learn how to. I had to relearn how to write for technical audiences when I went to work at Microsoft because, like I said, I have an English degree. So how I write, I write more like you would read a book, and it, mm-hmm. I struggle, you know, to have to kind of pare that down into, you know, you got to get to the point. You can make it, you know, enjoyable, but this is this is real like factual technical information that you need to get across and it needs to be the right way. <laughs> totally. So I have editors, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. I get edited, all, I get edited to the max every page and it's okay. Yeah, it totally is. And, you know, as you were saying, right, the reason that we call it syntax in physical human spoken languages and syntax in programming languages is because it's essentially the same, right? doesn't matter how you spell the word color as long as it fits correctly in the... It still makes the, the uh, same meaning in your brain. Everyone says color. Right. Oh, right. I think of an apple. Yep. Fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it, like you say, it's just learning syntax. The, the, the difficult part is taking the abstract concept of I want a website that does X, Y, and Z and turning it into the things, right? Um, <laughs> into an actual website that does X, Y, and Z. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. The the difficult bit is the conversion process, not the typing process, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree, I agree. So, okay, with that being said, because we, we, we're talking a lot about learning and teaching and, and C-sharp and, and languages and grammar, let's talk a little bit about um, the book that you've written. Um, sure. The, the learning C sharp by developing games in Unity. Now, I'll I'll say for full disclosure, I have read the I believe it was the 2020 edition, mm-hmm. and I know you've got a 2021 edition out. So let's talk about the book, and then maybe talk about what what the differences are. Right? If I just want to learn Unity, am I getting the latest one? Am I getting the the previous one? I mean, no, that's totally fair. Um, yeah. So this series I took over at the fourth edition, and basically what I wanted to do with the book is you know, teach a step-by-step way of learning the C-sharp language. And we could make a console app, you know, it, it, it wouldn't, that would, that's how I learned how to do it. But, you know, it's, there's a lot you can do in Unity uh, for low, I, I say low cost, and I mean low cost in, you know, the burden of how much you need to know. You can do a lot with very little know-how, and then you can build it into something really cool in Unity, which is why I chose to write the book this way. But basically, the the whole idea of the book series is just to learn how to program from scratch. Unity and C Sharp are incidental tools. They just happen to go together very well. And I like how they go together. Um, But yeah, the book takes you from zero programming knowledge uh, all the way to, in this new edition, we have a, a new chapter, a new monster chapter on handling data. So text, XML, and JSON, how to basically work with your file system and how to serialize and deserialize objects. So that's the new content. And I'm building out, you know, the last edition, the one you read, kind of ended with, you know, an intermediate level uh, look at syntax. So we kind of got into, I think it ended at like, well, let's use, you know, what's a hash set? When would you use that? What's a queue? Um, Things of that nature where they're a little more specialized, but you already kind of know what they're doing because they're collection types. And I got a lot of good feedback that was like, this is great, but I want more of the intermediate level stuff. And I said, okay, well, in, in that case, I don't want to pour more syntax on you because at this point, I've showed you how to read the documentation so you can figure that out. 
but I'll show you how to do more with what you've learned, which is why the data, the data chapter came about and I picked that to add to the new edition. Cool. Okay. Um, so you see, you, you said there it's all about starting with, um, I'm not going to use your words, but the, the extremely low barrier to entry that unity provides, right? Yeah. Because you, I mean, you can, um, spoiling like the first chapter of the book, but you can literally fire up the unity editor, I suppose it is, drag some stuff on screen and Hey, guess what? You've got a game world and you haven't actually written a single line of code, right? Absolutely. It's the visual. The nice thing about Unity is that, and I mean, Unreal does this too, but I'm just game engines in general that have a visual graphical user interface. A lot of it is drag and drop now. Like you can make Unity games without programming now. Like they have a system in Unity that you can, it's totally without programming. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, you can totally, you could just be a designer, never touch code and just build really awesome worlds in Unity if you wanted. Um, we do a bit of both. I show you how to kind of make a little, uh, you know, Unreal Tournament style <laughs> arena that's, you know, you kind of run around and, you know, there are some things to hide behind and there's a platform to jump off and kind of just reminded me of, uh, you know, when, when I was a kid playing, you know, going over to someone's house and playing four player, you had to, you had to grab enough kids in your neighborhood to have a full game and you all go over. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'll just make the prototype, you know, something like that. It'll be a good time, like Banjo Kazooie. It'll just be fun. Yeah, right. Yeah, and then I by like the that. end, you have a totally playable game, like a prototype, and it's super fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 do, I do like that. So, uh, I, this is a leading question because of what we've already said, and because, like I say, I've read the book, but I don't need to know any Z Sharp, do I? Going in, absolutely not. This yeah, is for this is <laughs> this is for everyone. I do, I do have a little caveat. Uh, in the beginning of the book where, you know, you kind of have to cover, you, you have to manage expectations, but sure. it really is for everybody. You can come in at zero. You can come in at 50. I've had even a few people who have messaged me who have been like, I'm a practicing, you know, C sharp and Unity developer. And like, you know, this was great because there were a few things like I didn't know, or I didn't know you could do this so easily. Great. Like that's fantastic. But primarily, yeah, it's for total beginners who just, want to get on the train and learn how to program and learn how to build something that's in their head. And it's, it's mm -hmm. fun. You know, it's the whole point of the book is that we all like human brains already function like this, where it's mm -hmm. not, it's not a big jump. I think there's a lot of stigma around like, well, you have to be a certain kind of person to be a programmer. Everyone is naturally a programmer. If you cross the street and you look left and you look right and you make a decision based on if a car is coming or not, you are a pro and then take an action based on that analysis. You're a programmer. <laughs> that is literally a conditional statement. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the whole point is to relate or translate these things that we do every day and sort of say, look, this is the same thing. You just have to write it the way it needs to be written, but it's built the same as you think it is. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I, I like that. And I like the fact that, um, the you're, you're building something that you can immediately see, right? So yeah. when I when I was at uni, we did C Sharp and .NET, but it was like, okay, so here is console dot right line hello world. Yep. There's twelve lines around it, but you don't need to know about that yet. All you need to know about is console dot right line, and like <laughs> naturally, someone in the room says, "What's using system mean?" or "What's a namespace?" Right. Space, right? And or why it is it waiting for key? Order. Like, oh, yeah. that's. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah right. All the output in the console yeah, is off-putting if that's your first experience. That's a, yeah, Like I said, that's how I learned too. You get a console app that's black with white writing and that's what comes out and you make a text game <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or Absolutely. something like that. Like, you know, this is, I think this is much more fun. And from the people that I've talked to that, that have read it in different levels of, you know, programming skill, Everyone has said, well, yeah, this is, this is a better way to learn because it's more engaging. You put something on the screen, you put a cube on the screen and it moves. Oh, wow. That's great. In four lines of code. How did you do that? <laughs> this is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I remember, um, we did a, uh, we, we did a, a module sort of like a single semester class on, uh, OpenGL, uh, yep. with, with C sharp and the amount of, 
And it wasn't a lot of effort, but the amount of effort it were, that we were required to, to put in in C Sharp and .NET to draw a, screen, a window oh, on the screen yeah. and show a square, right? And then it was like, okay, I've got my square. It's a single, it's like a, a set of polygon, it's a set of full lines, right? Mm. Not even colored in. Right now I want to color it in. Oh, geez. Now we've got to, we're like, GL, pop, <laughs> GL, push. Yeah, now you've got to fend all the vectors that are inside the line and change their pixel color. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. oh yeah no you it's <laughs> once you once you go through this book you'll understand a little more of how much work goes into engines like unity and unreal and any kind of engine that hides this kind of thing any compile anything that does this for you is doing a monster job like it's not it's not little it's a it's a big task to get to make it so accessible for us mm-hmm. yep and it's it's not like it's um you know sometimes I'm worried about magic and wizardry, but this is reducing that complexity right, and it's allowing you to build something now. Because one of the things that I say to uh, junior devs, when they especially the junior devs who get really excited and argue about we should use this technology, we should use that technology, I say to them, the boss doesn't care how you did it, just that you did it. Yeah. Right? It, does, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You spent six weeks writing your own library just to draw a box on screen that when they that when they click it, somehow they get money. Or if you do npm install or pip install or yeah. nuget add source or whatever, it does, doesn't yeah. matter. No, that's that's totally right. And that's why I don't, I don't, I usually don't answer when people are like, do you want to use, what should I use? Unity, or which one's better? You know, that's, that's a non-starter. It's just, mm-hmm. it's your preference, your skill set that you're starting at. And what you're, if you're at a company, what the, what the project requirements are. Mm-hmm. At, at this point, everything's kind of, it's an even playing, it didn't used to be. Like I learned Unity when it was sort of the, the, it was for hobbyists and students and people that were kind of just tinkering, right? This was like 12, 13 years ago. And, you know, now they've, you know, they're, they're product matching everything that other people can do. So there's no, mm-hmm. there's no reason to have that discussion anymore. <laughs> Go Absolutely. with what you want, with what you can, yeah. with the easiest road, or if you have some requirements, do that. Like, Absolutely. it doesn't have to be this, you know, it doesn't have to be the, the you know, you're, you're going to war and you're on two sides of the room going, ah, I'll never do that. I'll never go over to the other side. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it really doesn't matter what you use, right? And to your point there, um, there's a, a series of videos that I've been watching recently I think I brought this up on, a, on another episode, but there's a series of videos I've been watching recently where um, a bunch of VFX artists mm-hmm. use video game engines. They use Unity, oh, yeah. they use Unreal, to mm-hmm. do visual effects in real time. Like, yeah, they do post-production where, and CGI, yeah. Well, this is like this is like production, not post-production. There's one oh, where really? I watched this guy standing in front of a green screen, and he's doing his acting away. And the camera is being fed, the camera footage is being fed into a computer that has I believe it's Unreal, um, and the Unreal Engine is um, uh, uh, what's the phrase I'm looking for where you uh, you cut something out, but whatever it is, it's taking him out of the green screen and compositing him into the game world in oh, real time, and then nuts. that just makes video. You know, that's that's your video footage because that's why not, right? Because the real time stuff in a video game is on is to a certain extent realistic enough that it sure. could pass muster as special effects, right? Yeah, yeah. If you had a if you had a fast enough computer that could handle the input mm-hmm. output, why not? Yeah, the last I, one I, I heard about that was what is it? The district uh, Neil Bloomcamp, the guy who mm-hmm. did District Nine, and he made some really cool shorts using Unity. They're called Adam. And then he used, I believe he used something, and he, he used like CGR post production in Unity for a movie he released recently called mm-hmm. Demonic. Yeah, I haven't seen mm-hmm. it. I haven't seen the footage of what happened, but it, you know, I was reading that, you know, he's pretty involved, and people are, you know, small or big, you know, film studios and art houses are turning to this kind of technology because it's mm-hmm. it's 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 a built in special effects department. For you. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you um, can control. I, yeah, and I, I happen to know that uh, the Mandalorian, they do it. So they Is have certain really? sets. Yeah, yeah, they have really? sets where they have these 
these huge screens, these like panoramic screens that the actors mm -hmm. will act in front of. And it isn't, the idea is that the footage that they're acting in front of that's being generated on the fly will be replaced, but it gives the director a chance to actually see what it really will look like. Oh, immediately. cool. So it's like uh, prototyping the shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What so it's that going on. Previous oh, stuff, that's yeah. super cool. I didn't know the man learned that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Again, I believe that's unit. Uh, that's Unreal, but it's probably I mean, Unreal. They're a little bit ahead. They've always been ahead in graphics and rendering. Mm -hmm. Unity's catching up. You know, they have they have a lot of stuff that, like, like I said, they they've done a lot with film processing and CGI. But that doesn't surprise me that Unreal is a little. They're still. That's kind of their 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 unique selling point above the rest of the competition. So that would make sense. Sure. But. That shouldn't that shouldn't dissuade anyone from using Unity. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a there's another video. I'm sorry to keep harping on about this particular subject, but there's another video I've seen. Same visual effects artists where they they're doing a Bob Ross challenge, so they have to in <laughs> real time recreate a Bob Ross painting that he's oh. doing on the video in front of them. <laughs> One of them, you know, one person's doing it in Photoshop or Illustrator or something. Uh -huh. One person's doing it on a tablet, and this the the guy on uh, one of the one of the four people is doing it in a video game engine. Right? Oh, you have and to then, link that because that's I want to see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, they've done it twice actually, but yeah. Um, and what he does is he, he builds the scene, but he spends most of his time building the world around the scene, and right. then. When it comes around to showing it off, he just hits F5 or whatever the button is on Windows to start a Unity application. And he runs around in the area. He's like, okay, yeah. so, you know, this is the scene we recreated. But if we turn the camera around, we can see this character's over here, this character's over there. They're all, you know, uh, CG models standing in a sort of T-pose. Yeah, he's they're in the ragdoll. Uh, or no, yeah, yeah. T-pose, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but he's built that whole experience in less time than it takes Bob Ross to paint a painting. Immersive Bob. Oh, I would give a lot to have Bob Ross alive to do a show like that, where, where he's you, where he's in a VR like landscape, and when he paints, yeah, yeah. it creates you know virtual objects. That would be so wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh yeah, my would. goodness. <laughs> but oh, yeah, um, with that bit of uh, I guess gushing over with, um, let's let's talk about okay so. I want to build something in Unity, right? Mm -hmm. And you've said earlier on that your your book um, is all about let's do it with very little programming knowledge mm -hmm. that pre-exists, right? You, you said yourself. No programming knowledge. Nothing. You, you need hey. nothing. <laughs> you can use the free version of Unity and everything comes with it. So there's really, the book is the only outlay that you need to do. And like, it's just because, you know, I walk you through how to do a lot of things. <laughs> but like everything that's also why I like this kind of everything is sort of I want I don't want to say it's like equalized but the the barrier to entry and the like monetarily and sort of I don't know what to say it's not smart but like experience like experience yeah. and money don't play a role anymore in this in this industry to get in like at this level like if you just want to learn it's free. It's literally free. You just mm -hmm. go do it. But you know, you need you do need some guidance, and that's where my book comes in, which is which is great. But yeah, you need no programming experience. Uh, there are no fees with Unity at the level we're using, and everything you know. There's no hidden nonsense, so everything works as it should. Okay. Uh, what about three D math then? Because I do know that for a lot of people, math is kind of a sticking point, right? They either okay. They, they maybe don't know, they feel like they don't know enough or maybe they're feeling like, oh goodness, now I've got to go learn algebra sure. or geometry or trigonometry, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, okay, so yes and no. In my book, we only use vector math, we only use 3D math once and it's to detect if you're, when your player jumps, if they're already jumping. So we don't want to be able to just infinitely jump, right? So it, the only thing we do is we check if we're touching the ground, and then if yes, go ahead, jump all you want. If we're in the air, you don't get to jump again. However, Unity hides a lot of that 3D math in very, I wouldn't say easy, but in very sensible containers. And so 
even the little bit of 3D math that we do in one page to do this kind of check, we use Unity's pre-built functions and we, we literally tell it what we want to check for. We give it the player's object and we say, if, is this object within 0 0.01 you know, units of the floor? So there's, there's nothing that you need to know about that's like, you don't have to do anything that you don't already understand, like conceptually. Like you know that, you know, in the scenario I just described, it sounds sensible. You, like in Mario, you can't jump forever. You can only jump when you're on the ground. And so the whole math thing is, again, a bit of a stigma. I, I get that. I don't, I, I'm scared of 3D math. I use it a lot. It still kind of is an area where I am not comfortable because I sort of came up in the era where you, where people were still writing their own. And you really don't need to do that. You need to have a conceptual understanding of the 3D world, which we all do. So for my book, you do not need any 3D math. The one little bit of 3D math that we will do is explained. And we use Unity's uh, built-in functions to do it anyway. So there's no, there's no math from scratch in this book. <laughs> okay. Excellent. That's pretty good. Cause I like, I, I like the idea of not having to, to, to learn a bunch of formula and mm -hmm. learn a bunch of math to be able to do the, the work. Right. Because uh, like we said at the beginning, this is the whole idea of this is we, you know, there's no, there's not, not necessarily a deep end. There's, you open up Unity, you create a scene, throw some 3D objects in there. Guess what? Mm -hmm. You've got something started yeah. now, right? Yeah, absolutely. And like we, we do use, so Unity has a, a physics system that simulates uh, you know, object interaction. And a lot of that does have to do with the 3D map. But again, it's all hidden behind the physics system. So the only thing that's shown to you, I mean, unless you want to really dig into it, because it is, it is available, which is one of the things I love about Unity. You can go as deep as you want. But, you know, everything is very, you know, it's only, you're handed what you can use. You're not asked to create anything, like, from scratch that they don't, haven't already done for most things. Yeah, I like that. Um, again, it's that, it's that discussion of um, it's, not, it's not really magic because you can look at like the source and see how yeah, you can see together. behind the curtain. There's nothing yeah, stopping right. you from, from diving into the unity documentation. You can totally read their source code, but you know, you might not understand it or understand what's going on, but yeah, it's not hidden magic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, I'm guessing, you know, uh, the, the, the problem is that, like you say, if you wrote your own, you'd have to quite literally, like if you wrote your own game engine, Oh, First goodness. off, I would say, you know, I'd question why you're writing your own game engine. And then once we've got past that, I'd be like, okay, fair enough. You're writing your own. You're going to build your own 3D math engine. You're going to build your own physics engine. Then you have to go learn, you know, very detailed 3D math and physics, right? Absolutely. Yeah. If you're doing it, if you're doing something like that from scratch, you, you would have to be a, a math magician. You know, that would have to be your, your, that would have to be your thing in life. You know, yeah. that's, I mean, unity employs those, those people. That's why we don't have to do it. Sure. <laughs> They're um, underwriting all our math skills. Absolutely. And that's why I suppose a lot of early video games didn't really have um, realistic physics, right? Because they weren't hiring people who were maths and physics. Um, yeah. There was, wanna, yeah. Uh, like majors or. Yeah, people who yeah. have who do that who are not necessarily in the field of game design <laughs> sure. or development. Yeah, it was. Yeah, the math. I would say the the math and the technology were not at the same level. There were there were absolutely people who knew the math necessary at the time mm -hmm. that like you know something like Mario or even like Doom came out. Like totally could have done it, but they weren't making games. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Yeah. You know, we as time went on, we 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 were lucky enough. I have to say to because this this had to happen. Some people had to migrate, you know, from that academic sort of sort of industry or that part of uh, that pool of people, and they had to come over. 
because now we like there's no other explanation than that like we definitely have those people migrating into games and programming mm-hmm. but it, it fits i guess the same way you know if you think of uh net right dot net takes all the difficult things about um or even um uh you know JavaScript, modern JavaScript, NPM, Python, those kinds of things. They take the difficult things of creating a TCP IP connection, setting up HTTP envelopes and verbs and things, and they strip all of that away. All you need to do is do, if, you, if you're in NPM land, maybe you're using Axios. If you're in .NET land, you're probably using HTTP client. There is, there is a thing that wraps up all of that difficulty for you, right? And it manages, maybe it manages the, the retries and things like that. You don't have to, you don't have to build it. And and that's what I like about this, right? Because there is no, the, okay, it's not that there isn't a point in building all of that stuff yourself. It goes back to what I said earlier, you're not solving the problem, right? If my problem, if my problem is to send you an HTTP request, and I spend three weeks writing an HTTP library, I still haven't solved the problem, right? Yeah, no. I still haven't got my request. <laughs> no, and you, you end up learning that stuff anyway mm-hmm. in your own systems. Because we do mm-hmm. talk about the concept of like black box and things in the book a little bit and how you should start thinking in terms of systems and not in terms of line, individual lines of code. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you, know, you build up components, especially in Unity. You know, you kind of, it's sort of like Legos. Like you, you create little blocks and then you stack them and each block can do something else and by the end, you have an object that has a lot of complexity, but, you know, they're, they're kind of siloed away in their own little block, which is what you want. But yeah, mm-hmm. you learn how to black box stuff because you want your own code to work like that. Especially if you're in a team, you don't want to, you don't want to have somebody come ask, you need a day tutorial on what you did to learn how to use your tool. You know, we do that in, um, especially in the data chapter, like we create a data manager. And if you were a client, you know, that was asking for stuff from the data manager, we definitely talk about why we're writing it this way, because we're writing it to expose just the actions that you want and you give feedback. Like that's, that's the give and take of, of good programming systems, right? Mm-hmm. You give something, you want to take an action and you get a result and then you deal with it. So yeah, there's, you're absolutely right. There's no, you need to solve the problem, <laughs> Mm-hmm. there's at this point there's no reason unless it's that's like unless that's your jam if you want to build like if engine architecture is your thing i would never say oh you're wasting your time don't do that there's already mil- there's everyone's done that for you but for most of us like who have other problems to solve use what's given so and then solve the problems of your you know your unique idea that's really mm-hmm. the point of all this is to learn how to put your ideas into a product that you can interact with. Sure. Sure. I mean, I, um, there, there is, there is a, a project that's been going on. I want to say for about 10 years mm-hmm. called handmade hero. I don't know if you know about this Made hero. I don't. So, what, what is that? Yes. So this is a, this is a, I forget the chap's name. I do apologize, but this is a chap who an hour every day, he live streams building his own video game engine and he's been doing it for 10 years. Very cool. <laughs> Which I is would cool, watch that. But that shows you like how oh, much yeah. effort is required, right? Ten years in, and he's still not finished it, and he's doing it almost every day for an yeah. hour. <laughs> if it's one person, yeah, that's nuts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean that that kind of thing is why this. Um, I don't know. It's not open source, but why this avail wide availability of game engines is such a massive. When you think about it, it's a, it's a massive achievement. It's a massive undertaking to have gotten this far and to be able to play with it for free. Like mm-hmm. that's ridiculous that, Absolutely. you know, if the medical profession worked like that, you know, it'd be bonkers, but like, it's this, I would, I would even say like, it's, it's a similar kind of achievement, especially since it's been around a fraction of the time other industries have been around and they've made such leaps and bounds. I mean, most a lot to do with you know they were in the right point in time where we have the technology to take their take it as far as they want Mm -hmm. uh but yeah it's just to sit back and kind of appreciate where we are with that where we can we have choices in game engines not just one or to build our own we have choices it's a marketplace (laughs) 
Mm-hmm. It is. It's, it's crazy that you could that you can do all of this stuff because I, I still remember being a, 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 a very young teenager, 13, 14, and hearing, because I had a PlayStation, right? Yeah. And hearing the Net Eurosi is a thing. You can build your own PlayStation games if you have a Windows 98 PC and you buy one of these kits. And if you do really well, Sony will be interested and maybe publish your game. And like, but then to be able to do that, you've got to write every single line of code yourself, right? I would imagine, yeah, that they're, because like I've, I've seen the dev kits now. I can only imagine what a dev kit back then would have been like. Mm-hmm. Like that would have been nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It That's was a lot a, of work. It was, a, it was a custom IDE. You had to write the code in C or Assembler and it used the parallel port on your computer. So yeah, it was it was That's really nice. crazy stuff. Yeah, <laughs> Versus, I can't imagine like, that. <sighs> yeah, right. You fast forward to now, and there's a lot more involved in Unity and Unreal than just file save as. But oh, it's, yeah. it's compa- comparatively, yeah. it's essentially push a button, fill in some stuff, do a little bit of work compared to you know the Net Eurosi or the N64 dev kits. And you've got a binary that you can then load onto a PlayStation, load onto an Xbox, load onto a Nintendo Switch. And guess what? It just works. <laughs> yeah, it's they really do have a lot of, or I should say, the services have come a long way. Mm-hmm. Like just the idea of being able to cross-platform publish a game is ridiculous. Like if you had thought of that when you were writing the base code, you'd have been like, "No, I I want to be sane. Like I don't want my head to explode." You know, and now it's just component pieces to the service that just spit it out for you. Yep. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> it is. And like I say, there's a lot more involved than just file save or file export or whatever. But compared to, like you say, compared but to... But it's doable. It's doable yeah, yeah, for yeah. more people. Like yeah, very right? few, the, the subset of people that could have done that in 1999, when, you know, if you had a PlayStation... Mm-hmm. is radically smaller than the than the pool of people that can do it now. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I, uh, every every couple of, I say every, I would say maybe every year, I go on to uh, Gamma Sutra and read the, uh, the post-mortem for the conversion of Resident Evil 2 from the PlayStation, which was on two CDs, oh, over to the N64. Oh, and it was, it was a team of six people that did it. But these people, you know, if you when you read through the the postmortem, they're like, "Yeah, we we may not have been at the top of our game, but we're pretty close to it." Because they wrote they they custom wrote like an an audio uh, uh, compression engine, a video compression engine, and took two CDs, one and a half gigabytes of data, and put it onto a I think it's a twenty four megabit cartridge. So it's not even like it, I think it was about eight or sixteen megabytes. It's crazy. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Every yeah. time I see a port that comes out, like you know, like Final Fantasy on iOS or something, I'm like, "How did you do that? That <laughs> came in four CDs. It yep. was it was this big. It was, uh, making a big stack hand signal, but it was yeah. huge. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, how did you get that on my phone? And it looks better. How did you yeah, do yeah. this? That is magic. When you can't see how they did that, how did tell teach me your ways? How did you do mm-hmm. this? <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, it, it is, and 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 the fact that we can we can access not all of the tools, but the majority of the tools required to get you started on that journey. So most of them are for free. It's oh, just yeah. it's mind boggling, yeah. and and again compared to how it was in the nineties and, and the eighties and maybe even the early two thousands, it's comparatively easy. It is. I mean, I keep saying it, but you create a scene, you drag and drop some shapes on there. Guess what? You've got a game, right? Yeah. <laughs> No, it is. And the, I mean, the internet is to blame for this in a good way for once, because the community, the world, the global community has, has allowed people to learn more faster. Mm -hmm. Like I think, I do love that unity and, you know, game engines are so easy, easy to use, but I honestly, I don't think any of that would be where it is now without like stack overflow or Mm -hmm. some, you know, or like unity forums. I don't think people would be creating as much as they do and as many people as they, you know, as are creating and especially not to the level that people are creating because there's, you know, you used to have to write in, you know, for like CD-ROMs with, with like, you know, a a course, like at the back of a magazine to get 
to get even an idea of like, what should I learn in what order? Like, how do I do this? Like that, the, the ability to be able to just ask people, ask anyone, just put it out there and it comes back to you. That's mm. nuts. <laughs> like, yeah. That, that sort of almost a democratization of knowledge, right? Absolutely. You want to ask me a question, ask away and I'll, if I can answer it, I will. If, if I can't, someone else will. Right. Yeah. I, I'm always surprised, you know, people think that, especially when I was a new programmer, I would go on and I'd be like, well, you know, I want to ask you a question, but I don't want to bother anybody too important. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not how it works. You could get, mm -hmm. anybody can answer you and they probably will, no matter what they, like, you could get someone, what was it? Oh, when I was running at Microsoft, like, people would be surprised that they would get a response, you know, for, for something kind of easy. You're like, no, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a question and I will answer. Like, it, it's, you're absolutely right. Like the democratization of information and the willingness to pass that information on to other people, even if they're, you know, very, very early beginners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think perhaps it's something that our industry does perhaps a little better than, than other industries where, you know, there, there are stack exchange, stack, stack overflow websites mm -hmm. for things like medicine and engineering and things like that. But I feel like the development space is a little more open to that. Hey, anyone can ask a question and 100%. anyone can answer it in 100%. both the good and the bad, right? Because you'll get the yeah. people come along and go, oh, you're asking a silly question. This is repeated. This is blah, 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 which doesn't help anyone, right? No, but then you get the people, the moderators who are like, you need to be quiet. <laughs> either yeah. like either don't say anything or link them like we're mm -hmm. not doing we're not gonna we're not doing this like they asked mm -hmm. a question they're entitled to ask a question in a safe space yeah totally so we 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 talked a little earlier on about the different things that you can do with video game engines we mm -hmm. uh, i mentioned a few um artists who are doing things i mentioned tv shows that are doing stuff with like previs and things like that um have, have you ever done anything uh, off piste i guess with with yeah. with unity or is it just I mean, being i'll build a scene and away we go no i did uh I, I did a fair amount in vr um so i have i did it my first course actually for pro site was a lot of fun i did a course on how on like locomotion and virtual environments because moving is very different and there are actually you know when i did some research and i had to read some met like you said, I had to read some medical journals like about physical reactions to like this new paradigm of how you experience, you know, digital content. I was like, wow, this would make an interesting course. We kind of have to figure out not only how to move in virtual space, but how to keep your physical body happy and to feed it information or sensory information that it can actually, uh, you know, use and not, you know, get sick <laughs> or freak out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I've done some virtual reality. I think that's, you know, most of the stuff that I like to build, it's, I like application architecture. So that's more my thing where I try and build better systems for myself sure. to make games. But um, I know I've said, I've said this a bunch of time, but like I was at Microsoft, I was on the uh, uh, mixed reality development team. So all their AR, VR stuff. Um, and I wrote a lot of their documentation that, you know, if you use, if you use <laughs> Microsoft docs, you'll, you'll see me around. Um, but that's probably my only sort of sidestep away from traditional games. Uh, most of the time I either build uh, Unity tools, which is another great thing that I love about Unity is that you can build editor tools. And I, you know, that sort of feeds my system part of my mind where it's like, oh, I could build a tool and then I could ship it and other people could use it. You know, I built one of the, that's, you know, that's what, that's what gets me going. Uh, I built a, like a free Firebase database debugger for Unity. So you can look, you know, cause I, you know, things like that where you, you know, you're writing a lot of repeated testing code, it, you know, that sets an alarm off in my brain. I'm like, oh, wouldn't a visualization of this be so much easier if you could just type <laughs> in your node and see what was there? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's. That's mostly where I'm at with Unity. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, I, I, I do like the idea of using this, this, this tool, these tools that we have, 
in innovative ways, right? That's why. So we're recording this just slightly ahead of .NET Conf, and I am. Mm-hmm. I, I, one of the things that I look forward to at .NET Conf and all of the different um, uh, conventions throughout the year, whether they're live streamed or in person, is seeing the innovative, wonderful things that people are doing with technology that make you go, "Wow, I didn't know you could do that!" Right? <laughs> Who thought of that? Yeah. Yeah. It's like using a hammer to build, you know, a better hammer, but you didn't Absolutely. know you needed the better hammer. But all of a sudden it's like, how do they live without this? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's why one of the things I'm really excited about with .NET 6 is the, uh, the reduced amount of boilerplate code you have to write. Yeah. So it's like top level statements, top level using statements gone. You don't need to supply a, a namespace if you don't need to. That mm-hmm. console.write line example, hello world, I talked about earlier on, is now literally one line. Yeah, it's super easy, right? Like with yeah, the new yeah, syntax. Yeah. yeah, it's all stripped down. I Yeah, absolutely. I think that's why I gravitated to Swift because when I was starting with C Sharp, it was, you know, you wrote iOS apps in Objective C, which was just as kind of aggravating. And then Swift came along and was like, we're going to strip out all that syntactic noise and we're going to make the syntax grammatic, almost grammatically correct. Was like, mm-hmm. Oh my goodness, it's like writing. It's like writing. You're writing, a, you're, this is the first time I've written a program <laughs> mm-hmm. and not built one. And I think that's a great move for C Sharp to move towards that simplicity where you're, you know, you're a little bit farther removed from the machine level and you're you're much closer to how our brains process input and output. I mean, sure. that's always the goal, right? Like we were talking about cyberpunk. Like that's that's essentially the goal of that is to hook it up to your brain so that there's no, you know, there's no gap between how you know a human brain works and how a computer works. So mm-hmm. I'm all for that of C sharp when C sharp is you know sort of moving that way. It'll make yeah, it much yeah. easier for people to start learning. As you said, with the console, <laughs> with the console output and you get one line, but then you get, you get the using statements at the top and in the console app, you get a whole paragraph of output and then the wait key that's just waiting for you to input to hit enter. And you're like, wow, what did I do? I have no idea what this is. I have no idea yeah. what I just did. Yep. And I think, I think that I, part of it, from my personal opinion, part of it comes from the fact that... Um, programming was a science became an engineering and and it sort of along the way it adopted enterprise practices and i think like it fits with c and c plus plus and all of those sort of low level languages uh, for people who don't know low level is like close to the hardware you know low level of abstraction whereas the high level languages like c sharp like python like uh, javascript that have lots of abstraction there but you can strip that away if you want these languages are now going, the, the architects of these languages are now going, yeah, but why? We don't need to do that. We did that originally because that's what everyone else was doing. But if we strip all of that away and allow people to, to we can infer a namespace, we can infer a class name, we can infer the using statements. If we strip all of that away, it makes it easier for people to get started. And that's what I'm all about. More people programming means more voices, means more experience. We means a more diverse and inclusive environment. And I'm all Absolutely. For Absolutely. Well, there's, I do talk about this at the beginning of my book because, you, you, like you said, you can infer, you know, the, the C-sharp compiler is fairly smart. Like, you can, mm-hmm. at least now, like, you can, you can leave a lot out and it'll fill in the blanks for you. But it is important to know that, like, that's good for starting, but that's mm-hmm. not like you want to move towards making your code explicit. Even if the compiler will do it for you, it makes it more readable to not have to like, you know, especially if you're reading somebody else's code. So like, you know, we can get, you've already talked to people about clean code on your podcast. It, it's, it's, it's a big topic, but mm-hmm. definitely do discuss these sorts of ideas in, in my book, just as sort of like signposts, like maybe keep this in the back of your mind. Like it's easy you can do it, but there, you know, if you want, you know, there is a little bit more intentional way of programming or, you know, mm-hmm. we don't get into design patterns, but, you know, at the end, it's like, well, if you want to go further, you might, you know, you're at the point where you need to start thinking about, you know, system wide architecture. You need to start thinking mm-hmm. about design patterns. You have all the syntactical and theoretical knowledge 
to kind of go off and explore, you know, oh, what's, con- you know, concurrency? How do- is Unity multi-threaded? How do I, like, can I, can I, how can I manipulate this to my benefit? You know, how can I sure. make the product that I want to make? And that's really sure. the end goal of my book is to get you to a place where you can not only find the resources that you need outside of my book, but you can understand them and implement them. Because if I just teach you syntax, it's not going to do anything. But if I can teach you a little bit about programmatic thinking, that translates to whatever else you do after you finish my book, which is, which is really the point of all this. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, I do like that. Um, yeah. The, the more people that we can introduce these, these topics and ideas to, the more voices we'll get. And, you know, coupled with that, um, Unity has this wonderful idea of, you want to write some C-sharp? Just create a file. Just here it is. And there's minimal syntax around it. A couple of using statements, a couple of methods you need to know. I just throw your code into there. And to a relatively uh, large extent, Unity will handle everything for you, right? If you don't do, you, as long as you don't write code that's horribly inefficient, then everything will just continue to work, right? Sure. Yeah. Mono behavior is the, uh, the cure all for everything. I know that's, you know, it gets as, as you, as the complexity increases, that's, you know, you can have your own issues. You can bring up your own issues with that as you like, but yeah, they really do allow like everything to be drag and droppable or just making, like you just drag your, your, like you said, your C-sharp script onto a physical, uh, onto a cube and they interact magically. Mm -hmm. Like they reference each other. And they, you can, you know, you can impose your will on the virtual cube. Like mm-hmm. that's on unhar- that's, that's, that's just nuts. I know I've said that a lot, but that, that to me, that concept of being able to do that so easily is mind boggling. The amount of work that's, that's hidden under the hood. Absolutely. I, uh, uh, I once read a, a sort of, I don't want to call it a white paper, but more of a report into like a decompilization, decompil, decompilation. There we go. A decompilization. I just said it twice incorrectly. Then a decompilation of the Final Fantasy VII engine, and this thing was like four hundred pages long, and it just dealt with the oh. data types. And oh. I'm like, that's amazing to read. But if I want to make something that is not similar in scope, but I want to create a battle scene that has RPG mm-hmm. elements, mm-hmm. create a scene drag some squares on to represent the good guys, drag drag some squares on to represent the bad guys, throw in, all right, I do have to write the logic, but throw in some logic. Yeah, but that's real, like, that's one, you could make that work with one method, or two methods, take damage and do damage, or even you could just have it reference it and do it in one method. Everyone can take damage. (laughs) And that's it. (laughs) And that's what I mean, like the, uh, the, the complexity of these things has really dropped and the barrier to entry really has come through the floor, I think, if not, yeah. if not onto the floor. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it's like the reverse of the glass ceiling. The floor has now dropped several hundred levels and everything's mm-hmm. like super accessible for the most part, which I yeah. love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so... um let's let's help remind the the listeners about the book then um sure, sure. i know i said it at the top of the show i know that the episode is named after the book but what's the title of the book again the book is titled learning c sharp by developing games with unity 2021 so this is the new edition just because we like to keep things current with the engine i do try and keep things as c sharp focused as possible again unity is kind of just the fun wrapper but we do use some unity apis or features so we do you know, keep this current every year. Um, But really the only thing we use is a little bit of physics and the navigation system to make the enemies look smart with, so we don't have to write, you know, that kind of code, that, that kind of uh, pathfinding code. But other than that, you know, unity, we keep everything pretty agnostic to to C sharp. Uh, Cause that's, it's not, there are plenty of other books, especially from Pact, on how to use the unity editor and all sorts of fun stuff. Sure. But yeah, so learning C sharp by developing games with Uni twenty twenty one. Um, it is now available at Amazon, and you can get it from Pact dot com as well. P A C K T. Um, and let's see. I think those are the only two real places you can find it right now. But it is um, 
it has an ebook and a print copy. So if you want the digital copy to kind of split screen while you're working, uh, I find that very helpful. But you know, there's something to be said for holding the book, so you can get both kinds. And uh, yeah, you can always find me. I, I do some editing for Ray Wenderlich website. I'm on their Unity team. Um, you can find my courses on Pluralsight and LinkedIn Learning. You just search my name. Uh, mostly Swift and Unity. Uh, I have some C-sharp stuff and a little bit of Agile on there just for fun. And, yeah, I mean, I'm not, if, if you have questions, I do answer, you know, technical or just fun questions on Twitter um, and Instagram. Uh, and we'll post, you'll post the links, right? I mean, I'm, yeah. you can look me up there too, but it's, it's, uh, you just, let's see. Insta is journeyman programmer and Twitter is journeyman coder. Okay, yeah. Cool. Always available. Even after you finish reading the book, I have a couple people that I talk to regularly who, who, you know, we, we kind of bounce things off each other cause it's, you find like-minded people. So it's not just about selling the book. I do like hearing about what people build. So if you have something cool or you have a problem, hit me up. Awesome. Awesome. I do know a few people who will be taking part in the game jam using you. Oh, yeah. So I should send them your way perhaps. Yes. Just so that you could sort of catch up with what they've built and how they built it, right? Yeah. I got one guy. He's, uh, his name is Thomas Barrett. I hope he's listening. He's great. He read my book. He was really excited about it. He messaged me a bunch and his uh, game jam on Unity, the newest Unity game jam, he's placing third. With, oh, wow. his, with his single button click game. It's really cool. But oh, cool. yeah, he's, uh, he's doing great. <laughs> so cool. it does cool. happen. You get, you got all these ideas, just learn the syntax and start making stuff. That's it. That's it. Uh, I like that. I'll have to see if I can track that one down or maybe you can get a link for the show. Yeah, I can get you a link. Mind. Yeah. Cause that sounds pretty cool. Cause that's, that's the thing, right? Just to sort of wrap up. That's the thing. You, you don't have to build the tool. The, like if you imagine a woodworker, right? You don't have to build the chisel and the hammer and nope. all of the other woodworking tools. <laughs> you just go buy them. Or in this case, go use them for free, right? The yeah. only limit is your creativity. And that's yeah. what I love about these tools. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a natural progression, especially with programming. The better you get, the more complex things you can build, the better you have or the more you have to learn because there's there's problems, the better you get. So it's a self, you know, replenishing cycle. You get better, you build something better, and then you get to a new kind of ceiling of a problem. And you're like, oh man, now I have to learn about multi-threading. Well, okay. Now I have to learn about how to, you know, create a system architecture. Okay. And it kind of just keeps positively reinforcing itself, which I love because it's built in. Like there's, mm -hmm. it, you don't have to do it on purpose. It just naturally mm -hmm. happens. <laughs> Yep. It's the same thing with like music, right? Exactly. You, learn, you may lay, first thing you may learn, you may learn scales or before that you may just learn that there are eight keys and a bunch of like half steps between them. Mm -hmm. but you don't have to worry about them. Then you learn about the half steps. Then you learn about scales. Then you learn about like tonality and then you go, right. Okay. Now we're going to learn about chords where we put three of them together. You no longer need to remember C plus uh, whatever, the three notes are that make up the C major chord, right? Right. You just need to know it's where the chord. to <laughs> Yeah, right? It's the C chord. And then once you've done with that, you then move up to, I don't need to remember how to play the song. Uh, rather, I don't need to remember the chords to remember how to play the song. I just play the song, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get to the point where you come up with, oh my goodness, I've got this long improvisational bit. I don't need to think about what I'm doing because there are key parts I have to hit. Same thing with development, right? Like you're saying, you learn how to do Hello World. You learn how to put a box on screen. And the next thing you know, you're building full system architecture, right? Because like you say, it's built in. Just learn, pile these abstractions on top of each other, and you're, you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, because it's a naturally, you naturally run into questions that you don't know the answer to, but you know enough to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that, that keeps happening. It'll, that'll never stop. You know, and that's that's the beautiful part about it, which is sort of like how, again, like people are already programmers. We do this in everyday life where we, we continually learn through interaction and response. And it's the same thing, which is why, you know, you can't tell me that we're not all pro that human brains aren't program you know, aren't programming machines and that we're not all kind of pre wired to already be good at this. Like it's not a it's not a special skill. Everyone can do this because we're already built that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I, I agree with you completely. But what I'll say to you, uh, Harrison, is um, I've had an absolute blast talking with you today. And uh, I am worried about using up the rest of your day because I feel like <laughs> I could sit and chat with you for the rest of the day. Right. We could keep going. We, so. we could do things. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Jamie. This has hey, been no wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a whale of a time. If you're interested in anything that Harrison's talked about today, all of the links will be in the show notes. So if you're listening away, don't worry about having to find a pen and write things down. Just press through on your podcatcher and it'll take you through to, there'll be, a, there'll be a bit on there with just links from the show, or you can click through to the website. There'll be a transcription of the, the discussion with links that we talked about uh, for things like that. There'll be a link to Harrison's book if you're interested in buying it. I can say that I read the 2020 version and it was it was a definite really good read. Um, I, I, I was like, wow, I can actually build a game. And I'm actually tempted with one of the kids to say, hey, um, over the Christmas period, over the holidays, why don't we build something, right? They yeah, can why not? mess with the Unity... Um, with the Unity uh, viewer building the scenes. And if there's anything that requires code, I can jump in and write the code, right? Let's see what happens. Yeah, why not? <laughs> build something. See, see what comes out. Absolutely. And if nothing else, it gets the kids doing something over, over the holidays, right? Exactly. Rather than sitting there and just staring at the TV. <laughs> but that's a problem for me to solve, not for the listeners. <laughs> But yeah, uh, thank you ever so much, uh, Harrison. I've, re I've, I've really enjoyed our chat today. Of course, this was great. Thanks so much. That was my interview with Harrison Ferron about how easy it is to get started with Unity and how you can use it to learn C Sharp and .NET, even if you have no programming knowledge or experience. And his book, Learning C Sharp by Developing Games with Unity 2021. Be sure to check the show notes for a bunch of links to some of the stuff that we've covered and a full transcription of the interview. The show notes, as always, can be found at .netcore.show, and there will be a link directly to them in your podcatcher. And don't forget to spread the word. Leave a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. Uh, head over to .netcore.show forward slash subscribe for ways to do that. Or reach out via our contact page. And to come back next time for more .net goodness. I'll see you again real soon. See you later, folks. .NET Core Podcast is a production of RJJ Software Limited.